All right, welcome back to All Over the Place, and we're jumping right in. We've got a guest with us from three guesses where he's from. I'm, I'm the Homer guy. All biases are on the table and actually on the ceiling and the walls today. So please welcome to All Over the Place, Bill Kantz, a fellow Penn State alum. Hi, Bill. Thanks for joining us. Outstanding. Welcome, sir. And our, our co-host, we met Jim already, and that's, that's Marty Zamora down there. And uh, so uh, Marty actually was on the football field at, uh, at uh, after the Rose Bowl victory. So uh, he, he's, he's been where you've been many a time, and I did not have the chance to experience it. I'm glad Marty and our friend Mark got to enjoy it. But uh, so, Bill, as a Penn Stater, going back, you know, you were on the 1982 championship team, Joe Paterno's first national championship, our school's first national championship. And after the three perfect seasons that Penn State had, 68, 69, and 73, what was it like for you to actually achieve what no other Penn State team under Joe Paterno had done so far? Well, uh, it was a thrill um, to be part of Penn State's first officially recognized national championship team. And you're right, Joe had three of them in the 63 undefeated teams that really got next to nothing in terms of recognition. Uh, great players on those teams in 68 and 69 with Mike Reed and John Eversole and, and guys like that, Franco Harris, Michael Mitchell, 73 team, uh, went undefeated yet. Uh, Joe's teams weren't uh, uh, you know, given uh, any kind of consideration for the national championship. All the pieces to the puzzle fell into place our senior year in 1982, and that followed a very successful 81 campaign where we ended up ranking. Being ranked number three in the country. We had guys like Kurt Warner and Todd Blackledge coming back. So we had a nucleus of, of, of guys on offense. Um, and as I mentioned before, this, uh, again, things couldn't have ended up any better despite losing to Alabama down at Legion Field. Um, uh, we we uh, resurrected some things, got back to basics. And by the end of the season, we were in line to play Pitt, uh, beat those guys, and then uh, aligned to play Georgia in the Sugar Bowl for the national title. And you wrote a book about it, uh, When the Lions Roared, uh, Joe Paterno and one of college football's greatest teams. And um, in it, we'll, we'll get into you know, the breakdown on it a little bit later uh, and show a little bit more Homerism. But what I especially liked about the book, it's an oral history, which to me makes things uh, much more interesting. Well, uh, some of my favorite books have been written that way. And what prompted you and what inspired you to go with an oral history as opposed to just a straight narrative? Yeah, the easy answer to that is that there was a reunion being planned in the fall of 2017, a 35-year team reunion. And um, I had some concepts of wouldn't it be cool to kind of peel back the onion a little bit on Penn State's first officially recognized national champion. Um, at that point, Penn State fans could have used some some good news, if you will, a positive spin on the program. Um, and the thought was to kind of take a, a peek behind the curtain at, at the team's chemistry. Um, we played that year. I mean, the opposition was um, pretty fierce with, with guys like Dan Marino at Pitt, um, Herschel Walker ended up playing uh, in, in Georgia, the Sugar Bowl, Mike Rozier, and Turner Gill at Nebraska. So um, the, the goal was to give football fans in general, a bit of a unique perspective, you know, um, get, get some recollections and reflections from, say, walk-ons like Greg Carey and Dan uh, to, to to the first rounders on the team, uh, what with um, uh, Todd Blackledge, Kurt Warner, some of those guys, and even pepper in some information about Joe from the assistant coaches. What was it like to work with him? Uh, Scrap Bradley, Dick Anderson, my position coach at Penn State, in particular, offers very unique uh, information that I don't think was ever been published before. So from that aspect, it gave a lot of Penn State fans some, uh, a great deal of information about uh, what they may not have known about that team. What I additionally wanted to do was also to introduce some, some metrics around this, the, the, the difficulty in that schedule we placed that we, we played that year. Um, this Believe it or not, uh, 1982, Penn State's first national championship is the only national championship team in college football history where half of the opponents on their schedule finishes in the top 20 on AP poll. Um, and, and some other metrics with regards to that strength of schedule 
Um, if you the website that I created to, to support BillConspeyIssue.com allows you to go out and actually um, sort some data of all the national championship teams going back to 1970, and it starts somewhere. Um, and it allows you to rank some of those elite teams. It's kind of like how well, these days people are ranking LeBron James to Michael Jordan or Will Chamberlain versus Kareem Abdul Jabbar versus Bill Russell. This data that I offer up on the website um, enables folks to sort through and not only compare a great Penn State team of, say, 1982 against the, um, you know, the, the 1973 along the Sooners, but you can also compare great teams from the same school. You can compare the, the 1983 Miami Hurricanes led by Bernie Kosar and Michael Irvin against that old one squad with um, uh, some of those guys. You know, and read and, and, and so forth. So it gives people some tools to use to kind of um, accomplish what I set out to do, which is to highlight exactly how difficult a schedule to play that. So since the publication of the book and people being able to go to your site and make these comparisons and uh, compare and contrast, how much more smack talk have you gotten from, say, uh, you know, some guys uh, from the 86-87 uh, Penn State National Championship or, you know, like, like uh, Alabama in, in the last few years? Has anyone come to you and said, oh, this isn't right. We, we, you know, it's got to be settled on the field. What, what, I mean, what's the feedback been like in terms of the smack talk arena? Great question. Um, guys from the 94 team seem particularly ir irritated at this. Um, Keith Conlon, who goes by the name of Boone, and I contend is the largest football player I've ever seen at Penn State. Um, he was Six foot six, six seven, goes around 350, has a head twice the size of mine. Um, he offers up the fact that the 94 team had never lost. Uh, I counter with the weak schedule that they played. The fact that they were down 28 nothing on the road in Illinois speaks to this team's inability to focus. Brian Gelsheim is on that team as well. I sort of um, point out the fact that Brian is in the all-time all top 10 in terms of tackles at Penn State. However, he has more assists than he does solo tackle. So it is spirited debate back and forth, but nonetheless, it's kind of cool that we're talking just like we are as all alumni. Um, you know, it, it's in jest, uh, it's all, it's not mean spirited, but it, it, uh, it, it helps paint um, our school in a favorable light. And all those guys graduated as did I. I think that is lost on a lot of people that, you know, Joe was a very fierce, he wanted to win as much as anybody, but he wanted to do it the right way and, and do what plays if you were going to go to class and graduated. And I also try to highlight that in the book a little bit uh, as to as to how this got done. And uh, you know, with Paterno and his uh, the grand experiment that you you got to be a part of, you were the, the again the first class to his his uh, does his plan with the grand experiment. For those not familiar with it, was he wanted his kids uh, on the team to be able to have the highest academic levels and prepare them to be men. But at the same time, at least once in their time and their four years at Penn State on the team to play for a national championship. And what, uh, what, what, what was it like, you know, being able to uh, fulfill Joe, Joe's grand experiment uh, plans? You know, um, I don't know that I, you went to Penn State with an understanding that you're going to play on some pretty good football teams. And the fact that there's some, um, some elite players uh, that you'll go against. So you'll get better athletically. Um, the focus, I, what, what appealed to me was that the pitch Joe made during the recruiting process never wavered. And that's what came, came out in the book. All the other guys from Warner to uh, Mark Battaglia, our center, uh, Ronnie Heller from, from Farmingdale, New York, the message was the same. You were going to go to class or your playing time was going to be affected in a negative way. And no clear example was my third day on campus in the fall of 1979. Joe holds a staff meeting. You can tell he was irritated to no end. And he announces that both Pete Harris, Franco's younger brother, as well as Carl McCoy failed their summer courses and were ineligible for the upcoming season. Um, Joe chooses not to suspend those guys for a couple of games, maybe give them a second chance at making their brains. Joe ends their senior years right then and right there. 
their careers at Penn State are over because those guys took the grades lightly, uh, didn't do what they were expected to do with regards to keeping uh, their academic progress going towards a degree. And that spoke volumes as far as how Joe handled his program. Um, so you respect the fact that I'm at a place that the coach is going to take the academics somewhat seriously, going to make it a, a priority to keep it. Um, as well as get a chance to play major college football against some of the uh, upper echelon teams in the country. That was a great appeal to me. And Marty, you're, you're uh, of course, uh, a Southern Cal guy, uh, but, and our friend Mark Valencia uh, switched, uh, he became a Penn State fan early in his life um, after playing some peewee football and looking at the linebacker you. But from your perspective in, in Southern California, I'm getting, you're probably a USC guy or UCL, or probably USC, I would think. But uh, what, what was your view of, of Penn State through those years before and then after they finally got the national championship? Well, from as early as I started watching college football, which would have been about maybe 11, 12 years old before I really realized it was something more to this than just the NFL, uh, it was always, uh, at least on this part of the country, um, kind of known even at a young age how in the world are they able to be so good with such high we'll say character standards or academic standards we know at usc they were throwing hookers through the kids dorm windows i mean we knew it was bad there and you also everyone just knew that wasn't happening at penn state that was just there was so many i mean i met people who New, new people that took tests for players. And, uh, you know, it was always amazing. How in the world are they able to be so good competing with all the other teams, which with, I mean, I don't want to say for sure, but we were all pretty sure they were semi-pro, you know, in the way that they were being recruited and treated and academically treated. If Marty, if I could comment to that point, um, Again, in the book, I keep referencing it, when the lines roared. But the assistant coaches at Penn State offered up something really uh, interesting. Um, Dick Anderson recruited the northern part of New Jersey, and I believe Frank Anna recruited the southern part of New Jersey. And that was Ben Forbes and Tyler back in the late 70s. They tell the story that Joe limited the number of guys that were considered academic liabilities to two per recruiting class. And I mentioned Mike Rozier earlier. Um, they have to stay away from Camden, New Jersey, because they knew Mike Rozier just wouldn't um, be able to um, sufficiently, you know, he would fall behind and they, they spend up. Joe would worry about spending more time on the guys that were academic liabilities rather than the guys who were there for the right reason. So, uh, in some respects, we couldn't even recruit some guys because of the reputations in high school. If they weren't going to be at least making the attempt. And, and the coaches, the assistant coaches, really had to sell Joe hard. I remember Frank Garrett telling me off the record that John Williams fit that category, but um, John ended up out doing well at Penn State. But there was this um, Dick Anderson phrase that, that at times it seemed like you could only recruit kids who were going to go to the Ivy League school. There were certain kids that you couldn't take a chance on because of their academic reputation. And Joe would limit the number of guys to that. And John turned out to be a model student. I ended up playing a couple of years with the Lincoln Patriots and was a you know, part of that 1982 national championship team. And to the recruiting, you're a Western Pennsylvania guy. You're a Pittsburgh area guy surrounded by Panthers at a time when the Pitt-Penn State rivalry meant a little bit more, a whole lot more than it does now, unfortunately, since Penn State joined the Big Ten. Well, I mean, what was your opinion of Nittany Nation growing up and then before and then, you know, after you were recruited? Yeah, it was about Route 22. There were some great athletes at Pitt, as many as Penn State. I cite in the book, once again, um, the 1980 game. Um, I believe there were 13 future number one NFL draft picks. I think Pitt had five guys that went on to either the college football or the National Football League Hall of Fame. Penn State had a few of those guys. I mean, I'm talking about the 85th team with Ricky Jackson, Hugh Green, uh, Mark May, Russ Grimm, Maria was on that team as a sophomore. Um, a lot of talent on both sides, and you knew that the winner of that game 
was going to uh, have the there was a real possibility that team could play for the national title. We did it in 82, spoiled Pitt's uh, chances to do so in 81. And earlier than before I got there, Tony Dorsett led Pitt largely based on a win over Penn State at Thurber Stadium. Pitt later goes on and beats Georgia in the Sugar Bowl to win their last national title. So it was a pretty fierce rivalry. One of the guys you played with, Mike, Mike Zordich, Michael Zordich. And I, I don't want to get into innocence, guilt, anything like that. But just, and I'm going to go for I'm going more for the Penn State pride thing right now. But of course, you know, we, we've talked about uh, the Penn State uh, scandal, the Sandusky scandal, all that stuff on the show. And when we had uh, Dr. Spanier on, we talked to that in depth. But I want to get your perspective as someone who played with Michael Zordich, the senior, and then watching what happened in the aftermath in that first season that we played, what it was like for you to see Michael Mowdy and Michael Zordich get that team to rally around the Penn State ideal, staying there when they could have gone anywhere, and knowing the family, what, what, what your opinion uh, was of the guys who were able to keep the, the program afloat? Well, first off, Mike Zordich is one of the classiest individuals you ever meet. His wife, Cindy, I think they met at Penn State, had a great kid, and it was apparent as to the virtues of the uh, they raised their children, what type of leaders they would eventually become. Mike Zordich, from a talent standpoint, was one of a couple of freshmen that stepped on the Penn State field in 82 as true freshmen and made significant contributions. Um, I don't know what Mike's uh, uh, viewpoints are on the whole scandal. I can only tell you that um, having been on campus for four years, well before those incidents allegedly occurred, I just don't have enough information to offer up any type of accurate synopsis. I can only speculate on what I think happened, how it was handled. Um, suffice it to say, it has left an indelible stain on an otherwise very reputable institution. Um, it tarnishes the good things that Penn State continues to accomplish. Just last couple of weeks ago, fall, the dance in Marathon raised over $15 million for pediatric cancer. Uh, there are other great things that Penn State has done. Uh, we've got uh, so many great things that are now, you know, kind of overshadowed by this, uh, what I could get, the double state. Um, you know, to that end, I'll offer you this story. You talk about the Penn, Penn State rival, rivalry. Well, when the news first broke about what my daughter saw, uh, a Pitt alumnus whose brother, older brother, went to Penn State. Troy Benson played linebacker at Pitt and later for the New York Jets, and I see Troy as a scratch golfer, and I would see him at some function. And the summer after the, the announcement was made about what Mike McCleary saw, Troy comes up to me, literally close talks to me, and he gets right in my face. He goes, why didn't McCleary just beat the living crap out of Jerry Sandusky, right? So I thought about this. This as an observation. My wife, Merle, and I are sitting on our back patio on July the 5th. I know this because Mel's mom was up there staying overnight, but as we're out there having coffee in the morning, I'm reading my newspaper, right? And I look up from my newspaper, I said, Mel, get in the house. Get in the house now. And the screen door went again, was right behind us. We got in here. What she did, thankfully, was not look at what I was looking, which was 20 feet away, just beyond our stone patio. A black bear, about a 250 pound black bear, was gnawing or trying to get to a bird feed. We had never seen a black bear in our yard in the 20 years we had lived. My point is this none of us could really predict what we would do when we witnessed something that's almost too incredible to think. So, judging what McCreary did and how he acted in the record, um, it, it, it's up to, you know. Put yourself in that situation and you're, you're not quite sure exactly how anyone would that. I'm of the mindset that Mike McQuarrie didn't do anything because there's nothing to be done. But the, again, I don't want to get into any of that stuff right now. I just know that I saw our our, our alma mater, I saw people rise to the occasion and, and do, like you, you mentioned the pediatric cancer, the, the recent record with the uh, the thon, the dance thon that we do there. I know in the, the wake of things, we raised almost $5 million to combat actual child pedophilia and not alleged and uh, that that's who we are and that's why you know I, I know that you mentioned your your teammate Michael Zordich I, I, he raised a son 
who along with Michael Mowdy got that school and, and kept it the way, you know, our, we really are and, and not the accusations mm -hmm. that were made. But again, that, it's, I, I, you know, your, your perspective as someone who, who knew someone in the family and, and knows better than most people, someone who got to play for Joe Paterno and knew what he was really about and what the real Penn State way was and continues to be. So that's, that's you know, all that really needs to be discussed on that one. I devote a little bit of a, 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 separate chair, a separate chapter in the book about not only what my reflections are, but what my teammates were. And I'll stop on that note, even though my name is at the bottom of that book, it's really the, the vivid recollections of about 35 of my teammates and assistant coaches. I just collaborate, I just collected the information, tried to put it in a, in a readable format, but there is a separate chapter. And it's, it's very interesting to read my teammates' thoughts on the return of the assistant coaches. Um, I, I ended the chapter basically talking about the statute, which has now been removed. I don't know too many college coaches that have a library, a wing of a library on campus that have been named after them. Um, to me, that's where that statue should be re in front of the T library. And get a statue of Sue up next to it, too. There you go. I'll settle for that. Has there been, uh, you know, with, with the book, you know, you know this is, uh, what, 2017 was the publishing year, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, has there been any uh, any inclination to maybe do a, a follow-up to some other Penn State recollections? Or, mm -hmm. uh, or, or you know, M M Marty's the NFL guy, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw to him now to see, you know, what, what I'm the college guy. Marty's the pro guy. So, Marty, ain't, ain't, you know, stuff for Bill and his, his uh, many pro NFL experiences. Uh, yeah. Um, quickly, before I ask that question. It just occurred to me when you guys were talking, when the Penn State scandal broke, I would say most people who know college football, that's the last place they thought anything would ever go wrong. It was, are you sure they didn't mean Florida State? Are you sure they, like, it was very shocking that it was there because of that reputation. I'm, I'm a big Florida State fan, Bobby Bowden, all that. He was, I wouldn't call him the opposite of Joe Pa, but he looked the other way a lot more. And so when people say, who's the greatest college coach? I mean, I, I got to go with Joe Pa, even though I'm a Florida State guy, because of the way he did it. Similar amount of, uh, similar uh, record and very different reputation, very different way of doing things. So anyway, <laughs> uh, on to the pro thing. Uh, I, I really wonder how... I don't know what your 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 largest was, but I know you were around six five two seventy, come you know coming out of college more or less, and an offensive lineman. I so, I mean, was that uh, was that kind of the, most of the guys on your O line uh, were they were they pretty much that size? Marty, when, when Eric had sent me the rough draft agenda, that's one of my things, so you must be a mind reader. Um, <laughs> we had weight limits at Penn State, believe it or not. My, uh, mine was set at 255, I think, or 252, I take, take that back. But um, yeah, the Joe imposed weight limits. He, we, you know, this is the era before the 300-pounder. Um, I, I date back to when William the Refrigerator Parody came out out of Clemson in 1986, I believe, 80, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but somewhere around there, that's the first time we started seeing guys weighing over 300 pounds that um, could move. Now, you'd have an occasional guy on the team, um, Stan Brock in New Orleans, 6'7", 300, Keith Van Horn with the Bears, 6'8", Anthony Munoz comes to mind when you're Southern Cal alum. Um, you'd occasionally get a guy like that but you start to really see greater power to show up on a um, recurring basis, uh, starting around the mid-80s. The, the heaviest I ever weighed in the world in my final year in the league in 88 was 275 pounds. Oh, wow. Um, on each shoulder. You know what I mean? My frame, um, I, I got away with long arms and, and what have you, but the game really started to uh, embrace the bigger um, athlete. Um, this the NFL combine we saw on a weekend here, he got the NFL Network. The Ohio State offensive line, his name is Dewan Jones. I had 
blink when I saw that the guy's six foot eight. He's a four hundred pounds more than I ever weighed. He's three hundred seventy four pounds. His wingspan is eighty eight inches. So these are these are guys that are are, are playing my position. I play which is offensive tackle. They're more like wide body power forward, uh, and they're agile and they're uh, just big people. Um, and the game has evolved and to a point where the 250 pound linemen um, a generation ago or 30 years ago, if you will, is now 100 pounds heavier, can move just as fast and, and mm -hmm. so forth. So, in that respect, that the game is you know, more violent, obviously, because these guys are bigger and faster and stronger. That's how we've always been the case. But um, uh, it's, it's just crazy to see how big, how mobile these. Well, you're a tight end by today's standards, Bill. How are your hands? Yes. Hands, <laughs> you know, they all point your fingers point the same direction. So, <laughs> but if it hits your hands, it, it, that's not going to be the worst spot to hit you is your hands. You and you, they can throw you, in and you confident you'd make the catch. It would all depend on how much of uh, stickum and and substances I would use to have the ball. Uh, I don't know. I, Everyone's well, wearing gloves now. You can get away with stick them so much more than mm -hmm. they used to. We'll call your hands semi soft. Your Southern Cal guys, going back to the schedule, for sure, um, the recognition, the lack thereof, if I might go back to that point where the undefeated teams are recognized. I think at that point, Joe um, looked to uh, see who, what teams were winning the national titles Notre Dame, Nebraska, Alabama. And Joe says, look, go ahead and schedule. What, what do we have to lose here? We want to showcase our program. We're going to get that national recognition. One of the games uh, ended up being a Fiesta Bowl against Southern Cal. Uh, Marcus Allen was on that team. And uh, just the talent, Chip Banks returned to an interception for a touchdown. Chip and I was teammates in Cuba. The guy was just chiseled. Clay Matthews was on that team. Munoz playing with Cincinnati. Just uh, Clay turned from the blues. Uh, a lot of talent assembled at Southern Cal in that, in, in that era as well. Really well. I did have a, a little bit of a it's a crossover sort of question. In your opinion, and I've always wondered this, um, a guy who's maybe not a uh, a blue chip recruit, or even a guy that's he, he's probably not going to start or even play much, but he will be on the team. What compels a kid to go to a place where the weather is not as good as Miami or you know San Diego State? They're not going to play anyway, or you know, but they still go. You see these guys that are in the snow going to a college where they they're never going to. Not only are they not going to play, but they're not going to be seen, even if they were good enough. I mean, is it is it this this pride that we talk about with Penn State? I think when I went through the recruiting process, there was a, a targeted list of schools. You know, your family wants to see you play. Um, that may have factored into it. You know, you knew going to Penn State when I went there that you weren't going to get on, unless you were a Kurt Warner, you were not going to get on the field right away. This was a team that uh, six months prior to me getting on campus, they had lost the Sugar Bowl 14 to 7 to Alabama. And this is a team that returned Bruce Clark, Pat Millen, Lance Mell, or Peggy, Snoop, Mark Gooman, guys that went on to extend it through the NFL. So, you know, you waited your turn. I don't know that athletes these days um, have that as an option. You know, the transfer portal enables them to go someplace else. Um, it, it, it's changed the dynamic in, in some respects. As far as playing in, um, in kind of weather, yeah, I mean, if, if all things are the same, you certainly want to play where the competition uh, has on national TV. It's in a nicer part of the country weather-wise. But I don't know that two or three star level may, may have those options afforded to be honest with you. On that note, now with the, with the talk of the, they're expanding the 12 team playoff the next season, the season after, one of the things I saw, and who knows, they're still hammering stuff out, but one of the aspects will be potentially having a, a higher seed, like for, for the first round or maybe first two rounds of things, playing in their home stadiums. So you might actually have everything we've talked about being, you know, in inclement weather, Big Ten territory. Oh, I we'd love to see Southern Cal play in 
the snow, or we'd love to see, you know, Florida State come up and play in the snow. This might actually happen. Do you, do you think, do you see this as a good leveling of the playing field, you know, getting some guys either in Beaver Stadium or, or the, uh, the big house up in, in Ann Arbor? I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm on the fence with this, with this creation of these super conferences. 16 to 18 teams. I think that's going to further isolate. You're essentially going to have the Big Ten and the SEC and everybody else. I don't know where the league fits into that. Um, as a player, I'm not so sure I'd be crazy about um, if I'm on the Southern Cal volleyball team and I got to take a cross country flight to, to play Rutgers. You know what I mean? That's going to be a lot of travel. I don't know how they'll part and parcel that out. Um, you know, a 12 team playoff may extend the season. To me, that, that's even more pressure on the app. You know, uh, in the <clears throat> 40 years ago when I was going through this process, I had to go home in the summertime. You got to work a summer job. You got to get away from the program for a couple of months. And, and you know, not only that, that I think serves a purpose. You know, what I mean? you want a break, if you will. Um, nowadays, you have an early enrollment where these kids are on campus in January and they're going through. You know, you know, spring drills with, with guys that are four or five years older. To me, that cheats kids out of their best time in high school, their final six months. Um, I, I don't think that's it is what it is. The money, you know, that, that now rules the rules. So uh, it's, it's tough to work um, with, with what it's become. You know, how they set up that 12 team playoff, I hope it doesn't evolve into 16 games. I think. This and uh, of course i i always joke that the playoffs came about joe joe had been advocating for playoffs for a long time happens of course after he passes away also he had been advocating for years a stipend for players give them you know some pocket change let let them do this it i mean let's say it, it is a business in the college ranks or it can be much more depending on what school you're at but now kids are getting more than a stipend with this uh, name, image, likeness, the NIL. And how do you think that is uh, going to adversely or be a positive for, for the student athlete? Name, image, and likeness will affect maybe 5% of it, the, the, the elite athletes. The ones that make a splash early on are going to be afforded those, those types of contracts. I'm, I'm concerned um, that uh, you're having... They just recently passed uh, a law in Florida, a bill that now allows the assistant coaches at any Florida school, and I think I looked this up the other day, can assist in the facilitation of an NIL deal. That's a huge advantage for a coach to go out and say, we can offer you X amount of dollars, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it certainly closes the book on that myth of what a student athlete is when you start to monetize what a kid's value is on campus and what it is in, in that regard. Um, I would like to see a percentage of that money afforded to uh, any player. I would see, I would like to see a fund created to offset any medical costs that kids would incur as a result of injuries suffered while on campus. In other words, if you tear up a knee your senior year at USC, uh, it doesn't work out for you for football 10 years down the road. You need uh, a revision surgery, you need a knee replacement. Who's paying for that? I don't know that the NCA that the program exists where a kid can go back to the scene of the crime and say, here's where it occurred, and here's why I now need a new surgery. So in that respect, some of that money that's generated in these NIL deals could be for the common good. I also see it isolating it to the only major sports of maybe football and basketball. Penn State has an outstanding wrestling team. We just won the Big Ten championships yesterday. Our volleyball teams do well as well. I don't know that those athletes get the exposure that they can in order to uh, allow NI deals to be afforded to those athletes as well. Again, my two cents on it, and the world involves, despite the conservative views I have on what the money should be allocated for and how it be spent, but ultimately money corrupts absolutely. I forget that phrase they all use, but in the end, I think you're going to see it be something that, that is, a, is a detriment to, to the whole college experience. I'm not sure how it's evolved, and I know with the Penn State Alumni Association, the National, they, they sent something out last year, how the NIL is evolving at, at Penn State, and they are making sure that this money gets siphoned and gets put into programs across the board with all the other 
uh, the, the non-monetary, the non-monetizing sports and just making sure they have the opportunities and whether it's uh, programs, uh, whether it's uh, internships or, you know, getting them placed with, with uh, you know, helping them. Guide, and uh, well, once they graduate, getting in, into different businesses. And I, I love the fact that it's called success with honor, something that Joe Paterno preached. And, you know, the, the university may have turned its back on him Sadly, in too many ways. Again, I don't. We, we've gotten into that uh, enough on the show in previous episodes, but I'm glad that they're able to recognize the phrase "success with honor," something that Joe advocated, preached, and lived, is still alive through the NIL, and just making sure that across the board, it's a positive yep. for all student athletes at Penn State. And I and I agree. I think it permeates. You know, not that the football program that was the one with the most exposure or got on the map, if you will, but I think. You look by and large, you don't see Penn State teams trash talking or belittling opponents or rubbing their faces. You saw the wrestlers conducted themselves yesterday at a Big Ten network with class, our basketball team, the last minute in the parallel, um, the excitement, but handle it in the right way. And, and the, the inherent message there to future athletes is that we do it a certain way. That, that phrase, we are, resonates. With all of them, because I think we conduct our affairs regardless of your national or not. You're doing things um, without cutting corners. You're doing things the right way. You're trying to um, help mold and motivate and, and set the right example for the people in society. And I'm not just partial to Penn State. I think there's athletes and, and, and alumni at Southern Cal do it the same way as they do it at Pitt, at Michigan, and some other places. I, I really do. I, I think that the, the experiences me how to conduct yourself. Um, the, the lessons you do, I think we're taught at a lot of institutions in a lot of different ways, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. There is a little bit of gray area you can operate in and go for. And um that fact it's for being part of Joe Paterno's programs. With uh, and, and this is I know that James Franklin, I, I see fraud land and all these things. I, I know there's a frustration with this football now mentality. And I hate I've stopped reading comments actually, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, social media comments it just gets too frustrating but to see all these armchair quarterbacks and just like oh well unless we're playing for a national championship it, look that's icing on the cake you know that better than anybody but you know as a Penn Stater I, I, I've been very impressed with James Franklin in the Joe Paterno mold wanting to make these guys men and and good quality men first and a byproduct you know being guys in the NFL and I've looked at you know he's put a lot of guys into the NFL in his tenure there and you know your, your thoughts on James Franklin, whether it's, you know, in, in the mold of Joe Paterno and, and, of course, carving his own path at Penn State, what, what, what's your take on James? Well, it, I think anytime you see you're trying to replace a legend or uh, someone that's accomplished as much as Joe, it's a tall order. Um, James, in his own unique style, uh, has kind of got his own, he's got to appeal to a different type of recruit, I think. And um, someone that has social media as a uh, distraction uh, in, in some respects. And he's got to confront a lot of, it's not as simple as it was back in the day uh, when Joe coached. Um, it's, it's a more challenging environment. You have a lot of um, sensitivity to social media. I keep going back to that where the athlete wants to make sure uh, they're at the right place and their needs are met. And it's, it's selfish to some degree. It really puts a lot of pressure on a coach to consistently perform. You know, to James's credit, save for his record against top five and top ten opponents, he usually beats teams that he's supposed to. And he produces ten win seasons. And we've been in New Year's Day bowls. I find that acceptable. I, I don't know where we crossed over to say if a coach doesn't win a national title within the first five years, um, his efforts aren't, uh, should be recognized, we should look for a replacement. In this day and age, with what they're paying coaches, there are fewer James Franklins on the planet than they are, than there are more mainstream guys that if they aren't cut, then uh, an alumni, a board of directors is apt to remove them and replace them with something that could be costly. It's going to start from scratch, it may not uh, embrace the core principle that the school wants. So it's, it's a, a and sword. He's walking a fine line with what Penn State's program used to be under Joe Paterno and what James Franklin wants to evolve the program to be. Overall, I think he's done a, a more than adequate job. This will see continued improvement and, and uh, on occasion the Ohio State and the Michigan booth. 
those, those uh, great white whales if you will out there. Got himself a Rose Bowl. Yeah, uh, you know, um, beautiful place too. I mean, it, it, Pasadena, I now went up for the 94 game against Oregon, and then I was just enamored. That's a giant circle bowl one way in. If you're in row 100, you're, you're, you're all in the There's no other deck to that stadium, but what a, you know, there's such history there, you know, and then to see back every day when the Big Ten and uh, the Pac 10, you always see Michigan and Ohio State. Uh, Michigan has like faced up against great Southern Cal teams, other KTC, UCLA, but um, you understood what it, what it meant to be um, able to play in such a prestigious event, the granddaddy all the world, right? Obviously, you know, when the national championship has chronicled throughout the book and all, all the games from that 82 season, you've got some other to talk about game wise. But outside of the row, uh, the Sugar Bowl, the cha- national championship game, what is, you know, the whether it's pro or another uh, Penn State bowl game or just a regular season game, what one meant the most to you? What one that sticks out the most is memorable. I'm inclined to, to, to go with the Sugar Bowl because of what was at stake. And it's not like we consciously thought, hey, if we don't win this game, there's another botched attempt to win a national championship. But it seems like the entire country, because of the number one versus two matchup, and we had such a formidable offense with weapons like Blasco, Warner, and Gary, and uh, Kenny Jackson, Mike McCloskey, we, 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 were in a, we were being able to showcase what Penn State stood for and the way we went about it. Um, and we were on the Georgia was their third straight trip to the Sugar Bowl. They had won a national title with another game, uh, first freshman year. They had narrowly lost to Pitt on the last second. So, so Georgia was used to being there, and Penn State sort of had a, a chip on the shoulder. Georgia never won a Sugar Bowl before. So the, the hype and the hoopla that surrounded the game, and then post game, the flight back to Harrisburg, and the uh, ninth minute drive up to the uh, around 220 to get back to campus and watching all these small towns wave their foam fingers out in the dead of night, 10 degree weather with fire engines and so forth. Um, a lot of my my teammates shared some uh, uh, very poignant uh, their thoughts of their own. So to answer your question, I would say that the culmination of my career is in my senior year and beating Georgia in the Sugar Bowl probably has to be that iconic moment. And it's something I, I always mean to ask you when, when we get together at the alumni events and everything, but I, I, it just hit me now and I'm not going to forget because you see guys, well, what you, you'll see uh, like in the, when the Giants play the Eagles now, you'll see Miles Sanders go up and, uh, and save one, you know, just the Penn State guys swap in jerseys, stuff like that. When you were playing, like how, how much smack talk goes on within locker rooms? Like say you, uh, you were, uh, I, I'm not sure, I, I have to look at the, you know, who were on your rosters when you were at the Saints and, uh, and after that, but uh what was it like uh, if someone was from Nebraska or Bama or the, the teams that you played or, or a Pitt guy? I mean, you're on your you're, you're teammates now, but it was how much smack talk went on from the college days? During the game, you know, I'm not saying it didn't occur, but there were less cameras on, uh, on, on the players to catch it, less camera angles and, and so forth. I wasn't necessarily one I was trying to focus on just not screwing up enough to get yanked from the game, if you will. But on occasion, you know, you'll, you'll bump into guys that are a little mouthy and so forth. It, it certainly take on a whole another uh, realm with regards to how guys want to chirp and get in somebody's ear and so forth. And, and I, you know, that's, that's part of today's game um, that may have existed, but not to an extent that it's documented now. It's not captured on film. Um, I I try to more align with and focus on the task at hand. I'm not sure I was good enough to you know, talk smack or anything, but on occasion, I, I did study the game program and who my opponent would be, you know, who was the cross line scrimmage the, um, um, the upcoming Sunday, if you will, and if they happen to be a guy I faced off against in college, it, it, on occasion it would be a a, a, a brief discussion on it if the, if the opportunity presented. You remain professional about it. Good. You're 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 a bigger man than I am in that regard. I still like I still like throwing the S H I double T on P I double T on the few Panthers that I run into these days. Although, like you and your con, you you occasionally write columns for the Altoona Mirror, and I noticed that you uh, you're rather a complimentary of a, a pit coach recently. So I was like. We, as we get older, we mature. We may, you know, unless they're playing Penn State, I may actually cheer for Pitt out of, out of Pennsylvania pride or Western Pennsylvania pride. 
So uh, well, what's it like for you uh, actually get, keeping up the, the literary toes in the water with, with the columns? It allows me to continue to sharpen the sword, so to speak. You know, it, it keeps my, my writing skills a little bit polished. I, I don't have any kind of uh, affiliation other than I know Neil Rudell has been a sports editor at the Atom Mirror since I was playing at Penn State. We got to be close friends. He invites me to be part of the Nittany Nation. Um, he's called Nittany They do a show the day after a Penn State game. And when I drive back west from the state college, I stop in Oakland and record the show. Um, and I just, I think, back in the spring, so I'm sitting here in Arizona and I'm thinking, what is the first topic I actually sent to Neil was on the Houston Astros cheating scandal, and I kind of made a loose correlation between that and the movie A Few Good Men. Then he pared it down, but um, we actually got a kick out of it. So it's evolved into um, sports satire, if you will, from a perspective of somebody that played one of the sports, but I don't try to limit it as just a football. And I also try to interject some type of subtle humor, kind of what's in them to some degree. So I send it to Neil. It's his ultimate call as to whether or not it gets published. But it, it's certainly something that, you know, when the weather's not as like it is today here, beautiful day in Arizona. Uh, when the weather's a little cloudy, I find myself motivated and inspired to write something. I'll, I'll try to put something that I think people like. And um, I, it's, it's, uh, it's therapeutic in a way. I enjoy uh, writing. I can't pull out that I ever write something in the future, you will look into some type of sequel. I don't know that I have an idea about that just yet, but for the time being, it's kind of fun to, you know, once or twice a month, send something to deal with it. It's his choice as to whether or not it appears in print. Well, I, I'm glad you include me on, on the list of those. I enjoy reading the, the the wit and wisdom that came across in the book for sure. And it's memories of Altoona. And yes, there are, there are seven or eight O's in Altoona for those who are not Pennsylvanians. As we wrap up, I, I want to I want to throw Marty's direction because I, he, he's a, he's a big uh, Steeler guy, big NFL guy, and so uh, Marty, have at it. Well, at the risk of slightly offending our guest here, how many wins do you have against said Steelers? Marty, I go back to a point where when I was with the Cleveland Browns from '83 to '86, we had lost I think 19 straight games in three of the stadiums. That's how dominant the Pittsburgh Steelers were in the Super Bowl era. And we would bust down, whatever, and nothing worked. There was something that would happen um, that, that would invariably cost us the game. I think that ended after I left Cleveland. It wasn't as bad. The Steelers would struggle in Cleveland as well. But it was a great rivalry. Uh, you know, and you get a, a real handle on just how you know, passionate fans are. But the Cleveland fan base is so very similar to the Steelers fan base. It's as if the, the people forget that Cleveland once had, once was a very dominant team in the AFL, but or in the AFL back in with Otto Graham and Jim Brown, and, and in those days in the 40s and 50s, but when football was really popular, it was when the Bradshaw, you know, to, uh, Lynn Swan, and Frank Harrison, and the reception really put football, uh, it, 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 it replaced baseball as the national pastime. So I don't have a point of number for you. Um, it was uh, a true rivalry, I'll say that. And there are some people in Pittsburgh, they travel well, I think partly because the steel industry collapsed and you see a lot of Pittsburghers that have, um, you know, come down here to Arizona or have gone to other cities to relocate, if you will, to find work. But they do turn out in great growth and great volume. To, to... Well, I did always admire the resolve. And uh, if you look at the record, it's a very... Steeler dominated record. But if you look at the scores of those games, at least half of those losses were very, very close games. And even when, say, the Steelers were making several playoff runs and even when in Super Bowls and Cleveland was struggling, those games would be a three point game. It happened all the time. And the Browns fan is a special fan. They, they have resolve. I'll tell you what. They, you know, before they moved the team, before Alton Odell moved the team, I think 95 or 96, those people would, would jam in the municipal stadium. It was the arguably the worst field to play on. It was grass that never grew after October 1st. And by November, they were painting the dirt green to make it look like and you'd, you'd have sand on your face. It was the worst field to play on. That was 
you know, the natural surfaces. The state was 80 years old at the time. ARC requested that the city of Cleveland pony up somebody to help him improve it. They wouldn't do it, and they moved it. But it, it, it really took uh, a lot of the steam out of a lot of passionate Browns fans. They felt, um, you know, this, just the, the ARC stabbed them in the back. You know, he betrayed loyal people. I, I think most uh, fans out of your way in, uh, in Southern California, the Raider fans, you see Raider Nation um, just get behind their, their team. I think most pro sports teams have a significant fan base that is as long as the team's competitive, you know, they look occasion, you'll get fans to really turn on support for them. Yes, indeed. And the other thing I wanted to comment about college football, even the smaller schools, there is a loyalty, there is a, a passion. I mean, you can look now, the Rams, the Chargers, they can't get three people in their stadium. Every game is an away game for them. Unless, you know, Michigan is coming to Western Pennsylvania Welding Tech School to play, you're going to still see the majority of the fans of that small school be there and supporting And I'm a pro football guy, but, man, <laughs> there's nothing like college football. You hope that things like the transfer portal, which allows an athlete to jump from school to school to school. You hope the NIL situation, uh, that there's some rails put around it, because I can see that alienating the true college football fan and not have them be as passionate. The alumni, I think, are by and large going to turn out. It's that casual alumni fan that just throws up their hands and say, I don't, this doesn't appeal to me anymore because it's more a business than the idea that the guys on the field are going to have class on Monday morning and, and getting their degree on time. But, um, yeah, there's no substitute for a long time to travel. Uh, Big Ten, which we have been part of since what, 93, I believe, on contingent of Penn State fans go to Wisconsin or Iowa, someplace like that. You see uh, Michigan and State fans come to Happy Valley. Um, it's a cool thing to see fans support their team in that regard. And, you know, Bill, it just dawned on me, you're in 83 to 86 in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably walked by you on field at the Edinburgh State Games between the Bills and, and the Browns when my cousin was the assistant trainer. Right? Sam, the San Martigliano years. Just dawned on me, you went from one Itali Italian coach to another. I helped get San Martigliano fired because we started one and nine my, my second year in the league, right? So that's my guy. Coaching is going to survive. And this is the guy three years removed from cardiac kids in 1980 and the whole thing. So by 84, they had a lot of guys that had aged rather quickly. It gave Marty Schottenheimer a chance at uh, a head coaching position. Marty was a linebacker's coach under Sam. And then was sent down to New Orleans. Jim Mora, who had just left a very successful three years in the USFL, uh, ran that ship pretty tightly as well. So, um, in that regard, with respect to who was in the locker room um, trying to motivate us on game day, I had some uh, unique perspective there as well. I again want to thank you, Bill Kahn, for joining us here on All Over the Place. And be sure to check him out. Check out the book, When the Lions Roared, at Bill Kahn's, PSU.com. It's B-I-L-L-C-O-N-T-Z, P-S-U.com. But I want to wrap up with, uh, you, know, the, you know, the unfortunate passing of Franco Harris last year, who I, I think that Franco was one of the, th not the greatest advocate for our university, especially in the wake of what happened in 2011. And, you know, as a Western Pennsylvanian who got to see Franco make that immaculate reception in his rookie year and then became the Pittsburgh legend. Marty is like beaming with pride over there now that that was for you, Marty. But now, and now Bill, what, what, what did, you know, watch Franco play as a high school guy and then, you know, as a, as a Penn State or two, what, what did Franco mean to you as a Penn State or then, and then go, dovetail it into, you know, your Penn State and, and how you have become a Penn State ambassador in recent years as well. Well, growing up, and I'm 11 years old when Franco, uh, when the Immaculate Deception occurred, so you're enamored with the fact that the Steelers now all of a sudden having sudden success. That's their first winning season. They go on to win four Super Bowls right in the time when I'm going to high school. So you grow up a, a Steeler fan. How could you not? You're on NBC TV literally every Sunday. You realize later on the connection you have when, when you go to Penn State and you see the guys like Jack Hamm and Franco Harris and Lionel Mitchell with the Colts, and, and you see how those guys conducted their affairs. 
um, how they acted in certain situations, how they what they achieved after their playing days were over. Um, Franco has certainly um, carried the torch with regards to what he communicated in the Lincoln and Sandusky scandal when Joe Paterno was the hearing. Um, I had the good fortune again briefly of playing with Franco's younger brother, Pete, and also his younger brother, Giuseppe. So um, you kind of got the feel that Franco was raised in a household where respect and pride and, and all of those virtues uh, were pretty apparent. And I think Franco had a life um, where he, the fame that he garnered from his career professionally, he reached out and helped several, several communities and uh, efforts in the city of Pittsburgh. And he's more, he, he's as, um, as Franco's Italian army and the whole thing involved there, he was able to be one of those guys that gave back to the community that he played in. I mean, as we respect him, that oh, certainly came as a shock to everyone when he passed here recently. And I believe it was the week of a, a whole Steeler game where they were going to honor, like the 50th year anniversary of the American reception here, frankly, passed away a few days before that, which was a, a tragedy. Once again, Bill, th- thanks for coming on. Thanks for joining us here. We are very, very proud to have had you on the show and on behalf of Jim and Marty and then Christine. Thanks so much. And we'll have you back again as, as the season gets closer. We'll bring you back on the show. We'll talk some Penn State football. Thanks again, Bill, Marty, Jim, Christine. Talk to you guys soon.